We are so delighted that you stopped in today. Our desire is to provide you with scriptural teaching to bolster your personal walk with God. I trust you'll enjoy the selection. May you receive it with an open heart and a spirit of prayer. God bless you all. My first uh, message to you tonight will be drawn from the book of Deuteronomy. And in opening uh, this seminar, I have particularly prayed that the Lord would direct my mind and I trust that he's done. Deuteronomy chapter number uh, 32 I'm going to read I'm going to read two verses number 11 and number 12 As an eagle stirreth up her nest fluttereth over her young spreadeth abroad her wings taketh them Beareth them on her wings. So the Lord alone did lead him. And there was no strange God with him. I, I'm, I'm going to draw my title tonight from the first three words of each of those two verses. And I want to preach on as an eagle, so the Lord. As an eagle, so the Lord. Let's lift our hands and invite the Holy Ghost to quicken our hearts and minds in this place. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy, your goodness, your love, your power. God, talk to us tonight. Stir us with your spirit. But whatever happens, Lord, don't let us leave the same that we were when we walked in this building. Let something happen way down inside of our hearts. We love you, Lord. We praise you now. Thank you for what you're doing already. Thank you for your great spirit that we feel in this place. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord, the name of the Lord, the name of the Lord. You're worthy tonight. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you for your patience. You may be seated. There is a doctrine that has made the rounds in the past 15 years. Now, it's been around a long time, but I guess in the last 15 years or so, has gained a prominence that it never had before. I personally believe it is one of the most destructive and deceptive teachings that has ever been propagated from any pulpit anywhere. I personally believe that it has destroyed more people's faith and confidence in God than any other teaching, I guess, than has ever been taught. It goes by a lot of names. There's been a lot of manifestations of it in past times, but it's probably best known as the prosperity gospel. It's very simple in its teaching, and therein lies its great deception. It is, it is so deceiving, I think, partially because it seems to make good sense. To the human mind, it seems as if it's logical. And in fact, if you twist the scripture and lift certain passages from here and there and link them together, you can actually make what seems to be a good case from scripture for this particular teaching basic tenet is very simple and it is this that if you serve God give your heart to the good Lord and you do your best in serving him then you ought never have reverses 
You ought never have trouble. Everything ought to always go your way. You ought to always drive a nice car and wear good clothes and live in a nice house. You ought to always enjoy the blessings and the good things of God because God wills that you would prosper and be in good health even as your soul prospers. And so for those who serve the Lord, life is one long exercise of joy and fulfillment. The sun always shines. The birds always sing. The flowers always bloom for those who serve God. The problem is it ain't true that's the problem and no matter how fervently we may believe this teaching and no matter how logical it may sound to the human mind when we're out there in the world when we're facing life one day at a time and there's no sham and there's no fake and there's no veneer and we're very honest with ourselves we have to face the fact that friend it doesn't work like that sometimes the sun doesn't shine and the birds don't sing and the flowers don't bloom and when you get to thinking that all of those things are tied in with your relationship with God it will destroy your faith it will destroy your confidence because if it is true that good things always happen to good people then when bad things do happen it must also be true that we're not good people and that if you're serving God always always things ought to go good then when things go bad it must mean you're not serving God and if God loves you he only sends good things to you then when bad things comes it must mean God doesn't love you anymore I've come to proclaim to you tonight it just isn't so God loves you when the sun shines but God loves you when the storm clouds have gathered in your life you cannot gauge your spirituality by the circumstances of your life Now, I like good reports. I really do. And when I was struggling to have 55 in Sunday school, and I would go to meetings and I would hear all these great reports. Nothing wrong with them. I'm for them. They did help me, I admit. While I was there, I was the first one up. Hallelujah. Saved a thousand people in six months. I'm for that. Then I'd get in the car and I'd be driving home. And I'd be thinking about my church. I'm just trying to be honest with you tonight. Maybe I was carnal. I don't know. But I'd say, now, God, I, I, I don't understand. That fella don't pray no more than I pray. He don't love you no more than I love you. He hasn't given any more of himself to the cause than I have. And honestly, my thinking was such that though I never would have preached such a doctrine as this prosperity gospel in my heart of hearts, I tended to kind of believe it was so that if I was good enough, if I prayed long enough, if I could worship and jump high enough, if I could somehow work fervently enough, that I could earn the blessings and the goodness of God in my life. And if I just wasn't cutting the mustard, then God was going to shut off the spigot I had to impress him I had to get his attention and oh what a weight it was to carry for no matter how hard you work no matter how hard you pray no matter how hard you pull yourself out there will be times when the blessings just will not come and you've got to have a doctrine that deals with reality don't matter how spiritual you are no matter what's happened to you. Thank God for his outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Thank God for what's happening. I take great comfort for men that have won thousands and thousands of souls in a number of years. I'm all for it, our hearing of those things. But oh my friend, if it hasn't happened to you, it doesn't mean God don't love you. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with your ministry. It doesn't mean you're not doing what you ought to be doing. It means that there is times when situations arise that try the hearts of the most coward of men but we have to believe one thing God is no respecter of persons there is a purpose and a reason in our lives please 
don't gauge your spirituality by the number on your Sunday school register. Don't gauge your spirituality by how many people got the Holy Ghost this month. I'm not preaching anti-progress. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to excuse anybody for being lazy and unconcerned and not working. That's not my purpose. But I am telling you this. I've been where you are. I've seen great revival come. I've seen my church double in the matter of a month. But then I've seen the time when instead of doubling, it was going backwards. And I said, oh God, I don't understand. Don't you love me anymore? And I had to come to the place where I understood. The scripture says, I saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill. But time and chance happeneth to them all. Jesus said that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Even David had his problems. His foot almost slipped. He almost lost out with God. What bothered you, David? What got a hold of you? He said, I got to look at at how good the wicked were doing. And I couldn't get a grip on what was going on in my life. How did you cure it? I went to church. And I got to thinking about eternity. And I understood there is a purpose. There is a reason. come to proclaim to you on this opening night of our meeting that you've got to settle one thing in your mind tonight you will not survive where you are the situations you're in you will not accomplish your best for God until you settle this one thing God loves you God loves you just like you are And God wants all the time exactly what's best for you. We've got to believe this. We've got to understand his love does not falter. His compassion never changes. His desire for our good is always his first choice. From Genesis 1.28, after he created man, the first thing he did, and God blessed them. This is God's first choice in every situation, is to bless, not curse, is to love, not hate, is to bring the best into our lives, not the worst. That's God's first choice. Always has been. Always will be. The problem comes because of our immature understanding of what's best for us. My little boy is six years old, and boy, he's a, he's a sport. He's the greatest kid on the face of the earth. We have tried so hard to spoil him, and we just can't do it. My son has a very simple philosophy of life. It goes something like this. Play all you can. Work as little as possible. And never see a toy that you don't want. Now my six-year-old believes that me, that I, his dad, can do anything. Not, I mean, he knows better than physically anything. For example, we proved this winter that I cannot ride a sled standing up. We proved that. Very conclusively. But he believes I can buy anything. If I use that time-worn excuse, I don't have any money. He says, write a check. If I providentially forgot my checkbook, all oh, these kids of the 90s, use a credit card. He believes I can purchase, I can buy. It doesn't matter. The only thing in his mind standing between him and Toys R Us in his bedroom is his dad and mom. 
that if he can just convince us how desperately he needs these things, how important it is in his life that he have all these toys, that anything he ever sees walking down these huge warehouse aisles in these huge toy stores, oh, how diabolically they are designed. Oh, the only thing is if he can convince us, if he can beg long enough, if he can logically reason with us long enough, if he can be good enough, if he can clean up his room and say yes ma'am and no ma'am and yes sir and no sir if he can somehow get on that honor roll at school that's the only thing he needs to do impress mom and dad and utopia will have arrived he's six years old but I'm not and I may not be the world's greatest dad but I do understand a few things I know one thing it would not be best for my son for me to fulfill every desire of his six-year-old heart for me to give him everything that he could ever want and just shower good things on him all the time for if I could even if I could it would not be to his best for me to shelter him from every disappointment and every heartbreak and every disillusionment that though I might would desire to even if I could it would not be best for me to smooth out all the bumps and all the detours of life because character is built not when the sun shines but when the lightning flashes and the thunder rolls and the rain pelts down that's when what's in me is brought out into the light where I can learn my need of God and if I, being human, can understand being a little more mature-minded than my six-year-old, how much more does my heavenly Father understand that what I think is best may not always be best in my life at this time and in this place? I promise you one thing. I don't care no matter how bad I want it, how long I pray for it, how much I beg for it. If it's not for my best, God is not going to give it to me. He loves me too much to bring heartbreak and sorrow into my life because of my immaturity. The Bible says we know. It isn't we think or we believe, but we know that all things work together to the good of them that love God. God, that are the call according to his purpose Moses was dealing with this loving aspect of trouble in our lives of God's determination to do what's best for us even when it hurts and in his final farewell to the children of Israel Moses who loved them deeply wrote a song and evidently sang that song in his final goodbye and my text tonight is a portion of the hymn that Moses composed and sang in describing how God brought them through their wilderness wanderings and in trying to catch the thought that I am laboring to bring to you tonight Moses chose to describe God's dealings with his children as a mother eagle dealing with her young. And he saw this mother eagle and correspondingly our God in a threefold relationship with his children. He saw God as our disturber, as an eagle stirreth up her nest. He saw God as our developer fluttereth over her young. And he saw God as our deliverer spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings. Let me tell you something. I want to reiterate this. God loves us just like we are. I'm going to say that again. He loves you just like you are tonight. 
No matter what you may become, he loves you as much tonight as he will ever love you. In fact, the Bible says this is love. That while we were yet sinners, Christ loved us enough to die for us. He loves you like you are. But he loves you too much to leave you there. He's determined to move you from where you are tonight to where you can be. To develop the potential that lies in the breast of each and every one of us. When a mother eagle is preparing for the coming of her young, she takes strong branches to the high pinnacles of a mountain. And there she carefully weaves together a strong and secure sub-base for a nest, anchors it well to the rocks, high above where predators can reach, strong enough to withstand howling winds. There they're safe, and there they're secure. I'm so glad for the church. I'm glad he gave us this church. And here we can find safety in the time of storm. We we need each other tonight more than we ever have before when you're there alone and you think nobody cares you're wrong somebody loves you the church cares about you somebody's there to help you this church can be a safe haven but not only is it strong and secure but she carefully takes bits of cloth down some feathers, perhaps the pelt of animals that she has slain. And she lines that nest with all of these soft things. It's not only safe and secure, but this, it's a comfortable and a warm place. This place is life at its best. It don't get no better than serving God. He designed a church for our comfort. The problem is, sometimes it's too comfortable. After about two years, I think, of trying to stay full-time with our struggling congregation, a year and a half or so, interest rates started going up. The church had never been able to secure permanent financing there where I pastored. They were still living on a construction loan, which meant, of course, it was a variable interest rate in a day that wasn't much heard of. And... Uh, to this day, I can't bring myself to even think about borrowing money on variable interest. Because I watched our interest go from about 12% to 21%. And I watched our monthly payments go from 540 to over $1,100 a month. And uh, I had to go to work. Now, almost overnight, and I didn't know nothing, but I faked my way to a guy that said he wanted skilled paper hangers. I didn't know anything about hanging paper. But I figured... I could do it, anybody else can. So he asked me five questions when I applied for the job and I got all five of them wrong, so he gave me the job. God is good, isn't he? Hired me for six dollars an hour and after one day's work, he said, I can't lose that much money, you'll have to take five an hour. I said, I'll take it. And I went overnight from never having any money I'm living on ham, I have an evangelist friend that to this day claims he hates ham because he preached me a revival during that time. We had ham for breakfast and ham sandwiches for lunch and ham steaks for supper. So all of a sudden we had money. We could go out and eat if we wanted to. We were able to prove our lifestyle, our living standards. And oh, how easy it is to get comfortable satisfied how easy it is to find our little place and become contented them little eaglets you know they just waller them out a spot in some nice rabbit pelt in the edge of that, that nest and it just fits their little old body almost like it was made for them and they just waller a place up in there you know they don't have nothing to do just open their mouths mother chews the food for them, partially digests it. All they got to do is once a day or so she comes by and they just, she just drops it and just, they don't even have to swallow it, just kind of slides down. Reminds you of saints on Wednesday night. He made the church so safe, so secure, so warm and comfortable. And if we're not careful, we can grow too contented. 
with where we are and more deadly what we are. We can grow too comfortable because life is good. Good things happen. I'm a pastor. I go to meetings and I'm a pastor. You know, in our fellowship, it don't matter if you have two or two thousand, you're a pastor. And I, it ought to be that way, but that can be deceptive. It can cause us to become no better to be comfortable with 2,000 than with two. Comfortable is deadly. Satisfied is deadly. Contented is deadly. You will never reach your potential sitting in your little niche that you wallered out in the side of the nest that just fits your little, your little body. See, you can't grow. You just got to stay the size of that little niche. You got to keep that place. You got to be somehow contented and but mother mother knows better and one day mother lands on the edge of the nest no food in her beak but suddenly she starts ripping out everything comfortable she starts tearing out all the cloth and all the pelts and all the down and all all the feathers and all the cotton and off they go off the mom what what in the mom that's my wait wait mom that's my spot off it goes over the side of the nest. Mom, what are you doing? There's nothing left but thorns and, and, and prickly ends of broken branches. And Mom, I won't be satisfied here. And Mother flies away. She knows what she's about. Moses said, as an eagle stirreth up her nest. God knows how satisfied we can be. I want to tell you tonight, we can preach about prayer, but you never really grow in prayer until God stirs the nest enough to put us on our knees to seek His face. God knows we'll never reach for the next rung in the ladder until we're dissatisfied with where we are. We'll never get more of Him until we're hungry enough to stir ourselves from where we live. You won't get Bible studies until you get stirred up in your heart. You won't pray people through until you're dissatisfied with the same old faces, service after service. But when God stirs that nest, it is not because He doesn't love you. It's because He is our disturber. He knows what we can do. He knows we can do more. We can accomplish great things, but he knows we won't as long as we're contented with what we have and what we've done and what we are. So he rips out all the comfortable things in our lives. He stirs our nest. Sickness, loss, trouble, problem, mortgages, going haywire. What's going on, God? is stirring our nest. He ain't mad at you. He loves you. He sees something in you. You don't see yourself. And he's determined to stir you up and bring you to your potential. You're an eagle. You were made to soar, not to sit around a nest and be satisfied with what you've got. You were made to sail above mountain peaks, above storm clouds. You were made to sail high where the sun is shining bright and you'll never get there. Satisfied and contented and so he stirs us. He loves you. He loves you. He knows what a dangerous time it is when he has stirred our nest. It is not his design. It is not his plan for trouble and problem to drive us from him, to discourage us and make us quit the ministry, make us throw in the towel and resign what we're trying to do and go somewhere and just sit in a church. That's not what it's all about. He dis brings trouble and disappointment and a heartbreak and loss and setbacks because he wants to draw you closer and closer. It is human nature that takes us further. It's human nature that when we need prayer the most, we pray the least. That when we need to break loose and worship in spite of our problems, that we let them get us down and we can't seem to touch God. It's not His design for our problems to drive us out. But He will risk you before He will leave. He 
will see you backslid before he'll see you retarded, spiritually satisfied, living the rest of your life in the same old. loves you so much he will not leave you below your potential but he will constantly work to bring the best out in every one of us for you see problems are not random I do believe in chance I really do I do believe that some things just happen but not for us that's for people that don't know the Lord I believe when you give your heart to God, everything from that point has a divine purpose. There is nothing bad nor good that happens in your life that doesn't play a role in bringing you to the place that God can develop the potential that's in your life. That He can burn away the dross and purify the gold and bring out the best that's in you. Everything from that moment on is in the hand of God. He isn't just the disturber. Thank God Moses didn't stop there. Disturbing, disturbing is so real to us that we neglect that there is something behind that's stirring up the nest. It isn't a whim. God is not a sadist. He's not getting some kind of pleasure at our discomfiture. No! God is our developer. There is a goal in mind. Moses said, as an eagle fluttereth over her young. What an interesting choice of words this is. In the Hebrew, it's rakaf. It's the same word that occurs in Genesis 1 and 2 when it says, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. It means to pause, to deeply consider, to contemplate, to brood. It describes the awesome creative power of God gazing out over a void and formless planet and seeing majestic mountains and mighty rivers and beautiful meadows there was an end plan in his mind before he ever began and your life is not a random series of disappointments it is rather a God that sees the best in you and is patiently developing your best he has the blueprint for your life some of your strengths are in other areas than others. That doesn't mean you're not as good as someone else. It means there's something very strong in you that is not in someone else. Something strong in you that is not in them. you got to catch a glimpse of how God sees this thing. We complement one another. And if you'll let Him bring out your strong points, they will be plenty enough to accomplish the goal that God has set for your life. Way back when you were formed in the womb, God designed you with an end result. Before you were ever born, God knew you'd be a preacher. God knew you'd be a preacher's wife. God knew you'd be a whole missionary. He knew you'd be sitting here in this place before you ever saw the light of day. God totaled up your talents. God saw your abilities. And he said, I'm going to build this one. And I'm going to build that one. I'm going to sharpen this one. I'm going to bring the gold out in that one. And God is determined to develop you. I don't want to hold you too long, but I do want to preach what I got on my heart tonight. God will let life drive you to the edge of your ability. To the edge and over your endurance. edge of that nest she never has looked just like this one. that fire in her eyes they've never seen that before. that clicking razor sharp beak those bare talons those powerful wings flapping at them fear strikes their heart they begin to flee from her as she advances across that nest they run ahead of her until they reach the edge the other side and still she comes on still she drives them ahead of her she pushes them until there is no place else to go. And tumbling backward out of the nest they fall, flapping pitiful little wings. No muscular development, no coordination, no ability to fly. And down they tumble, head over heels, out of control in free fall. Slain by their own mother. Mom! What are you doing, Mom? 
You know what? Kids don't listen to this as does adults. When you take a test in school, if you make a hundred, you didn't learn much. You just learned that you knew what was on the test. You didn't discover the limits of your knowledge. You don't know how much more you made. It's when you miss a few that you've discovered areas of weakness. That's what tests are designed to do. Try this next time somebody in your church comes up and says, Pastor, I lost my temper today. Say, good! Good! Oh, but Pastor, you don't understand. I, I knocked a hole in the wall. Hey, all right! Way to go! Oh, but Pastor, I said some harsh things to my family. I should have never said them. Man, that's all right! Pastor, I don't understand. Have you lost your mind? Then tell him. I could preach about temper. I could teach about temper. I could call you in and counsel you about temper. But you'd never know you had a problem with your temper until you were tested and you failed the test. God doesn't send tests for us to make hundreds. He sends tests for us to learn areas of our lives. We need strengthening. We need prayer. We need development. When things have gone wrong, it's to teach us. It's to expand us. It's because there's something in us that God is trying to bring out. Down they go. Down they fall. Head over heels. They can't fly. That's the whole point. They can't fly, but they'll never fly as long as they're comfortable in the nest. It's only when they're driven into the air that they have hope of ever being what they were designed to be. Mother stands on the edge of that nest and she watches them fall, tumbling, head over heels, tumbling, falling falling to their doom below. Certainly, they're going to strike the rocks and be destroyed, slain by their mother. Oh, no, oh, no. Don't you worry about that part of it. She's carefully gauging the rate of their descent by the cliff face they're hurtling past. And at the right moment, at just the right time, when they've had time to work those little wings, she launches herself from the edge of the nest and down she flies. Faster, faster, passes her hurtling young. She gets a a perfect arc and right at the bottom with those huge wings spread out they fall one after another upon those wings and she brings herself high higher and higher back to the nest and deposits them safely again Moses said he's not just the disturber he's not just the developer he becomes our deliverer when the chips are down and the problems overwhelm us. Don't you worry. God can fly faster than you can fall. Just keep on believing. Underneath are the everlasting arms. And when you're hurtling to your doom, don't worry. He'll be there. There have no temptation taken you but such as is common to man but God everybody say it God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able but will with the temptation hear me some people believe that means God won't let you be tempted above what you're able that's not what it says it says the temptation will come but with the temptation here's how you can bear it he will make a way of escape his arms will be there he call on he shall mind that am I. I've been so down in the dumps. I question if I was called to preach. I've been so down in the dumps. I question if I'd ever do anything for God. I've been so low, so down. I wanted to quit. I wanted to give up. But in those hours, in the darkest night, he was always there to say, yes, I called you. I know what I'm doing. I'm working my will. Oh, missionary, hear me. I know you came here brokenhearted. I know you're struggling and doing your best, and you don't understand. But I've come to tell you, you will not dash against the rocks. 
you will not perish. You'll be there. The Bible says he insisted they get in the boat. The scripture says constrained, and it means he insisted. I'm going to pray you get in the boat. We like to pray. No, I'm going to pray you get in the boat. And they got in the boat. They sailed out into the sea. And the night fell. And the storm came. Reckon Jesus knew that storm was coming. I'd be dead. I believe he sent it. They had just watched him feed five thousand. He wanted to know it ain't gonna always be like that. Loaves and fish will not always tumble from my fingertips. There will be storms. There will be fear. There will be doubt and questioning. What a storm it was. The mass was torn away. They broke out the oars and they were doing their best, but they were not making any progress. Never been there. The end was contrary. They were still his disciples. He still loved them. He still cared about them. And they weren't getting anywhere. They were, they were trapped in the midst of a heaving sea. days later he announced to his disciples Lazarus is asleep good they said you get better he told them plainly Lazarus is dead and I am glad don't you love Lazarus anymore oh it's not the question even the gospel writer made it, made it very clear before that story ever started. Now Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. But Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sake. And I was not. I wonder when Martha came to meet him, when he finally arrived at Bethany and fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you'd have been here. I wonder if the disciples did not steal a glance at each other with words, those awful words. Lazarus is dead and I am glad I was not there. 
Not there. He was not there. Not there when Lazarus gasped his last breath and death rattle began in his throat and his sisters were weeping their hearts out. No comforting words, no hand of love, no friend of all friends. Not there! Not there at the long, lonely wake. Not there when all the others were giving their condolences and they were only hungering to hear one voice. But he wasn't there. And that long, mournful procession to the open tomb. And he wasn't there. And when that stone finally locked into place uh, with a finality that seemed to break their hearts, he was not there. And he told his disciples, I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm glad I wasn't there. Why? Why would you put them through that? Because he knew that every one of those 11 would face a death horrible to think of. One would be tied to charging horses and drug literally to pieces over rough cobblestone. One would be tied to a stake and his body filled with with arrows. Another, another would be ripped asunder and his insides filled with corn and tossed to wild hogs. Another would be crucified upside down. Another, a pot of boiling oil. And he wanted them to be able to say when they were looking at death, I remember a tomb and a dead man four days and a voice that said, Lazarus come forth and I heard the rustle deep in the tomb and I saw him that had been dead and if he could do it for him he can do it for me and I can face death with comfort and confidence and faith because I was there Jesus was willing to trade four days of sorrow for a lifetime of faith and if what you're going through seems hard to take remember if you are in heaven through manifold temptations if need be it is only that it might work a more valuable day of reckoning in your life that you might come forth as gold tried in the fire more precious as an eagle so the Lord I don't know what you've been going through no way I could know but I do know what I felt in prayer for this service tonight. I felt like the Lord wanted me to come and tell you on the opening night. He still loves you. He still wants what's best for you. Everything that's been happening in your life will work in the end. So keep on laboring. Keep on believing. Keep on trusting. There's something in you that you don't even know. God will bring it out. Could we stand? Could we lift our hands together and begin to love the Lord? Praise God. Even when I am.